My name is Barb Sear, like he said, and I work for KFI, I work for Gail Fanjoy. Um, I am a parent to three young women. The oldest is Erin, and she's 34, and I have two grandchildren. My middle girl is Stacy, and she's 27, and my youngest child is Courtney, who's 21. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her life. Um, currently, she is a homeowner. She um, is, she works, she has her own business. Um, she's a church member. Um, she has multiple friends in the community and she's a, a neighbor. I'm gonna tell you um, about Courtney's life and kind of her history and how we got to the really good life that she has today. This is my daughter, Courtney. She's 21 years old. And like I said, she's a homeowner and a business owner and she has multiple great things happening in her life. The thing I want you to know about Courtney is that her life is ordinary in a way that all your lives are ordinary. You have family and friends and home and you work. And for Courtney to have an ordinary life, that's extraordinary. Here's a couple of pictures of Courtney. Um, the one on the left is her loading her vending machine. She owns four vending machines. And the other picture is her cooking in her kitchen in her home. Here are a couple of other things. Um, Courtney has a full life, so she does many things. Um, the picture on the left is her having a spa day with her friends, and they're choosing nail color. And the other picture is her horseback riding. What makes a meaningful life is being able to spend time with people who care about you, not just paid staff. One thing I want to tell you about people on this um, two slides is in the slide on the left, the young lady on the furthest left, her name is Catherine, and she's been Courtney's friend since kindergarten. In high school, the um, social worker noticed that Catherine spends a lot of time with Courtney, and she came up to her and said, I can really give you credit for spending time with Courtney. Um, our high school has a policy where you had to earn some credits by doing some kind of community activities and helping your community. And Catherine said, I don't need credits for being with Courtney, she's my friend. And Catherine told me that story and I thought that was really great that she had the insight at probably 17 to say this is a friendship. It's not earned or bought and you can't buy credits for being a friend with somebody. And so she turned that down and they have a, a friendship that's freely given and taken. So that's really awesome. The other picture is Stacy, who is my middle girl with her sister Courtney. And she's giving her a great big hug around the neck because she hasn't seen her in about a month. Um, so those are a couple of great pictures. This is the day Courtney got the keys to her house. We went through USDA and helped her um, become a homeowner. Uh, she used USDA, which allowed her to buy her home at 1%, and she's going to be paying for that home over the next 38 years. For her to have the home, it's gonna be $300 a month, which includes taxes and insurance, so it's very affordable. She only receives $721 a month for Social Security, so that's still a big chunk of her money, but she's able to afford to live there. She also has um, food stamps and some fuel assistance to help her. This is Courtney's home. It's a three bedroom home. It's a nice little ranch. Um, we fixed it up a little bit since we first bought it, put some shutters on it, planted some flowers. It's very homey. She actually loves being there. Courtney has um, what we call in Maine, the home and community-based waiver. And because of that waiver, she has 24-7 support. So she has staff that live with her. And they live with her um, two and a half days each. And each of the three staff have brought wonderful things to her life. We have a person who is into gardening, has helped share that with Courtney. We have another one that really enjoys doing fun activities and trying to find new things for Courtney to explore and try. 
And um, we have another person who was really, really gung-ho for employment. So those three women have really enriched Courtney's life. Here's Courtney doing some things. This is her in her kitchen, washing some dishes. She helps out around the house with some household tasks. This is her vacuuming. I think it says one-armed. <laughs> then I realized we all vacuum one-armed, oh well. <laughs> but she didn't like the sound of it. And this is her um, cooking in the kitchen with Emmy, one of uh, the people that live with her and help her. And they're actually making these cupcake bouquets for, for a church um, uh, supper that was going to have um, some auctioning of different food things. This went over very well. They made a lot of money for the church. And she really enjoyed cooking and, and getting help from Emmy. And this is the best part of cooking. Oh, here's her just setting the table. This is a picture of Courtney's pastor. And um, this pastor was also one of her high school teachers. Um, she had a very strong interest in Courtney and would go visit Courtney every single day and would talk to her and see how her day was going. So when we joined this church, she was very welcomed and Courtney had a familiar voice at the front of the church and she's really paved the way for Courtney to become a church member. And um, it's really great because Courtney has the gift of time. She can cook for people who are homebound. She's done a lot of cooking for church events. Here's a list of a bunch of things that Courtney likes to do. And we're trying to work on new things and find things that she hasn't done so that every year she can experience something new. How did we get here? How did we get to a place where a 21-year-old owns her own home, has a business, has friends, is a community member? has a lot of things going. Um, when I go over to her house, I don't find her home a lot. She's out in the community, she's busy, she's doing fun things. The way we got there is we did some early thinking about what we wanted her life to look like. And was it easy? No. Was it worth it? Yes. We really thought about what do we want for Courtney? What do we want our future to look like? And the reason things have been success, so successful for Courtney is she has a strong team around her. She has people who really advocate for her beyond just me and her father. There's um, the people who are on her team really care for Courtney and they want the best outcomes for her. Now, Courtney isn't a powder puff. She's not the easiest person to support. She has a long list of diagnoses. I usually forget that she's nonverbal because I communicate with her in many ways. Um, so one of the things, I wouldn't accept her label as her outcome. Um, as a person who has autism, cerebral palsy, and intellectual disability is probably the top three. Any one of those could just stop you in your tracks. I really wanted Courtney to have a full life and that's what we've really worked hard for. And I'm going to kind of divert a little bit. I'm going to tell you a little story. Courtney with CP doesn't really like to walk. But I like to keep her walking and keep her active. Um, there's a very small pond in our town which I thought if I took her to the pond we could walk along the edge, she'd get some exercise, she'd enjoy herself. So we took a ride up to the little pond, and I noticed there was one vehicle there. And it had New Jersey plates, so it wasn't somebody I was familiar with. And it was a woman um, who appeared to be maybe in her 70s, sitting in a lawn chair watching a young boy swim, probably maybe a grandson. And so we went to the shore, and we're walking along the shore, and I'm talking about the pollywogs and the fish and the weather and everything. And she's holding my shoulder. And she's kind of skipping and walking and making a lot of happy noises. And I see this woman staring at us. And I really don't care. We're having a good time. She's walking. And I know the woman's looking at us. And we go down to one side. And as we start to come back, the woman literally bolts out of her lawn chair, runs up to me, and says, she has optimism, doesn't she? I said, she's filled with it. And the woman was kind of taken aback. And so um, I really love that. I, I said, do you mean autism? She goes, yes, yes, yes. And I said, yes, she has autism. <laughs> I can only assume she's seen one of those um, advertisements on TV or something. So I really love that, that her diagnosis is now optimism. 
And labels don't define a person unless you, you let them. And Courtney's overcome many, many challenges in her life, and I'm sure there'll be more to come, but we're ready to meet them head on. And how did we get to that good life? I'm gonna go backwards a little bit. And here's the whole story. Courtney is, well, I had three miscarriages before I had Courtney. So I had an early ultrasound um, to make sure that everything was okay. And in that first ultrasound, um, Courtney already had a major blood clot in her brain. And we watched that kind of um, shrink and go away over towards the end of the pregnancy. Um, so I kind of went into denial that there was anything wrong. And when I gave birth to her, she had a very low birth weight and she lacked muscle tone and she had no suck reflex. And here are some pictures. I didn't put in the really, really early, early pictures. Um, none of them are very pretty. But I wanted to show you some pictures of Courtney and how small she was. The one on the far right is one year. She's 13 pounds. The one in the middle, she's two. And the one on the very far left is probably a year and a half. The reason I threw that in is we went to a Sierra family reunion and the person in the picture is great aunt Alvina, who was 100, I believe, that day, or around that day. And Courtney was the youngest seer member, and she was the oldest. And we noticed a lot of similarities, kind of a lack of hair, glasses, and probably depends. <laughs> Um, Alvina lived to be 103, so we're glad we got the opportunity to be with her. Um, so those are some pictures of her really kind of early on. Um, Courtney wore glasses when she was little. She, she um, had some services from the visually impaired and blind, and she actually had immature rods and cones when she was born, and over um, probably a few years, she was able to get rid of her glasses completely, although today she still has problems with depth perception, but she can still see pretty good. At about nine months, we took Courtney to a neurologist for the first time. Up until nine months, I was really in denial that anything was wrong with Courtney, even though she had no suck reflex, we had to have a speech therapist help us to teach her how to swallow every day. Um, it would take us more than six hours a day to even get any nutrition in her. Um, she actually didn't have any milestones met. She didn't do anything during the day. She just kind of sat and stared. Um, but when a baby's so small, you can kind of forget that they need to be doing something. So I think I was in denial. This neurology appointment woke me up. The neurologist said to me that she has profound mental retardation, because we don't use those words today, and that she would never know us, that she would not be able to sit unassisted, she would never walk, she would never talk. To keep her at home would be an injustice, it would ruin my family. Do you remember that slide a ways back that showed her hugging her, hugging her sister after not seeing her for a little while? That's a person that remembers and recognizes and loves. And, and um, everything on the list that the neurologist said did not come true. So that was about nine months when I got that kind of thrown in my face. And that at that time, I kind of started going through the stages of grief. And the reason I say stages of grief is because I think what I went through is very similar to somebody who does um, go through the stages of grief. I had it in my mind what my child was gonna be like. I had in my mind what it would be like to raise Courtney. And what I didn't have in my mind was anything about disability. I didn't know anything about disability. I didn't know how to proceed. And um, I had to go back and see the neurologist. I wanted to know what did he mean by profound mental retardation. If he had said Down syndrome, I think I could have had a vision. If he had said something else, I might have had a vision. With just that kind of profound mental retardation, I had no idea what to expect for her life. And so I went back and had a talk with him, and he really couldn't tell me anything positive. So I got a new neurologist. 
Um, we actually um, took her out to Boston from Maine. Um, it's a long drive. We'd go out to Boston and we would meet with a really positive neurologist out there and he taught me one very important lesson that everybody has the capacity to learn their whole life. And I said to him, well, I'm worried. Should I try to teach her as much as I can and get her to know as much and do as much and be as independent as possible? Or should I be kind of happy that she might be blissfully unaware if somebody should call her a name or, or pick on her? By the way, when I had her was the year that Forrest Gump came out and I happened to watch Forrest Gump and when they were picking on him, when he was running, I thought, oh, that's gonna be my child, somebody's gonna pick on her. But I decided I d I'm not in control of that. I need to teach her as much as she can learn and to be as independent as she can, as she can be because that's what she deserves. At the time we had a neurologist, we also had a cardiologist, an orthopedic doctor, an OT, a PT, developmental therapy, speech therapy. We had everything but the kitchen sink. And life was overwhelming. We had so much going on, and plus we had two other girls. But we worked really hard to give her everything that she could possibly need. The one thing, she wouldn't sleep. And I hear this a lot about um, kids who have autism, neurological damage, that they don't sleep, they're not good sleepers. And she actually would go days and days and days without sleeping. So my husband actually um, made this bed, he calls it the Courtney bed. Even though she didn't sleep, we knew she was safe. She actually had fallen out and um, injured her wrist, and so we were worried she fell out of her crib. So. He made this bed for her and she slept in, in it for many, many years. And he actually made her new bed, which is a queen size regular bed. He made the frame and she's transitioned into a regular bed. What this did for our family was let us know she was safe at night. Oh, I'm gonna tell you something bad about myself. During the years she wasn't sleeping, and there were many, and at one point she actually went 11 days that nobody actually saw her sleep. When it was time to go to bed, she would start screaming. And if she screamed too much, she would throw up. She was so underweight, we couldn't let her throw up. So if she screamed, we'd come get her. So we spent a lot of time being up with her and taking shifts being up with her. And I remember putting her to bed and her starting to scream, and I was so exhausted. And I went into her crib, this is when she was still in a crib, and she's in there screaming. And I knew if I picked her up, it wasn't gonna be good. And I know that you can't shake a baby. I took the side of the crib and I banged it against the wall and I said, go to sleep. And my husband bolted out of the living room, came in and said, you need to go to bed, I'll take care of her. And that's just how exhausted I was and our whole family was that we went through that for a long time till my husband went and made this bed. And so she could be loud, she could jump and bounce, it had padded corners and she couldn't get hurt. My fear was her getting hurt, so I was awake a lot. This is Courtney at age five. She was eating much better. Um, she actually had started to talk. Courtney now walked independent. She start, started to walk at three. She walks independently, even though she has cerebral palsy. She was eating. She was growing. She was putting on weight, and she was off to kindergarten. I was a little alarmed about sending her to kindergarten because they were telling me she was functioning at a 12-month-old. But off to school she went, and. Um, she did pretty well. At that time, she actually could speak. She didn't say a lot, but she liked to say things like ricky ticky ticky, digga digga digga, kitty kitty kitty. She liked the rrr. And, um, and she could say mama, and she could say daddy, and she could say nana, and she could say hey hey with her sister Stacy. But at age five, she had a brain hemorrhage. And she had grand mal seizures after that. She had left side weakness. And so we had to start with a lot more therapies. Something I started when she was really tiny, and I don't know why I did it, but I'm so glad I did. When she was really tiny, I would always tap her on the arm three times and say, I love you, I love you. And one day, this is after she lost her ability to speak, after she had her brain hemorrhage, she reached over and gave me three taps. And I went, oh, I love you. And she'd do it back to me. And so I yelled, Pat, Pat, you've got to come see this. 
And my fear was she wouldn't do it, but she did. And I said, I love you, and she, I love you back. And he says, let me have her. So he puts her on his and he goes, I love you, and she goes, hey, wait a minute, that's not fair. But I'm glad we started that little routine. And the reason that it was so important, because I know that means I love you, Courtney didn't speak again for 10 years. And she was on um, some pretty heavy duty seizure meds. When they started tapering her off, we switched some neurologist and we wanted to get her off a lot of meds. When they started tapering down one of her meds, she happened to come down the hall at the same time her dad was coming up the hall. She put her arms around him. She tapped him three times on the back and said, I love you, dad. First words out of her mouth in 10 years. I wish it was mom, but. When she went to school, I really talked to the teachers about what I thought was important for her. And what I wanted them to know was what was important to me was her feeling wanted, her feeling welcome. And then if they could teach her anything else, I was all for it. I wanted inclusion for her. I wanted her to be in the classroom. Um, we used PECS, a picture uh, communication program for Courtney, and she also um, used gestures, and she could bring you and show you what she wanted. And then um, we actually were able to move into a Dynavox. I don't know if any of you know those. The reason we did that is because she had so many pictures that we had three big folders full of pictures. She had more than 300. So when it was time for her to go out in the community or go talk at a friend's house or something, it's like, what do you bring? You know? So we moved on to a Dynavox, and from there we moved to an iPad, which she has today. Here she's using and learning how to use her Dynavox, which she really liked, and what surprised me was how fast she gravitated to that and how she was able to maneuver through the different pages and stuff, because it's basically a computer. Here she is at a doctor's appointment, waiting patiently, because she can use her iPad. Um, one of the things I wanted mostly for her was to have friends and to feel wanted and belonging. And so, in middle school, we started a club called Cooking with Courtney. And a lot of kids in her class would come over every Friday afternoon and would cook with Courtney. We'd make fun foods, and the bus would drop them all off at the end of my driveway. We also started a swimming friendship group. And the idea was we actually were able to get um, a facility in our town where we could go swimming. And the idea was that a person would, would bring somebody else with them. So we actually had a few people who had disabilities and they invited somebody else to come. My fear was, okay, all the people who don't have a disability are gonna be on the deep end of the pool and anybody with a disability is gonna be on the shallow end. And that didn't happen. They actually all swam together, had great times, and all wanted to be involved. And we also would make our house the place to be for kids to come and they would watch uh, movies and play Wii and dance and have pizza night. And friends can keep you safe. This is Courtney with a couple of friends. And the way they can keep you safe is they can call you mom when something's not going right. Um, Courtney was in high school and all the kids have cell phones. They're not allowed to have them in class. They gotta put them in their locker. And one of the ed techs shoved Courtney because she wasn't walking fast enough. She doesn't walk real smooth to begin with. Shoving her is not okay. So um, one of her friends picked up their phone and called me and told me what happened. And the ed tech admitted it. She said she wasn't walking fast enough. This was also the same ed tech who a week earlier was supposed to be watching her, because my fear is she's always going to tumble down the stairs. I really want somebody to watch her. Well, she wasn't watching her, and she pulled the fire alarm, and they had to evacuate the whole building. So that ed tech lost her job. In high school, Courtney actually attended the activities that the other kids did. Um, this actually is after uh, the prom. This is where they all got together. They had a big party at the bowling alley so they'd all be safe, not be out drinking and riding around. And this is her at the prom. She's the one in the red. The prom, I got a little story about the prom. My husband and I went to St. Martin for a vacation. We actually had an empty nest. 
she had moved into her house her senior year of high school. And she had her, um, she would take the bus from her house, which was two doors away, go to school for half a day, and then have some services in her home, and then have the 24-hour supports. I had gone to the school every single year, told them what I wanted, who I wanted to work with her, how I wanted to go, you know, had a lot of what I wanted to see happen. Her senior year, I was tired. We kind of let that one just slide by. Um, so she had gone to many dances and she had done a lot of activities. I knew the prom was coming up, but it was really the week I was going on vacation and I didn't want to make a fuss. Nobody asked her. She's had other dates and stuff. Nobody asked her, so I didn't really want to make a big deal. I was just going to kind of let that slide by. Well, there were a bunch of girls that were going alone. They didn't have dates either, and they wanted Courtney. They wanted Courtney so much they talked to the teachers at school about it, who then talked to staff who were supporting Courtney, who said her parents are out of town. Well, they called her sisters, Stacy and Erin, and said, what would your mom want to do? And they said, she better go to the prom. I didn't leave her extra money for a prom dress. I didn't leave her money for new shoes or get her hair done or anything because I never even thought she'd be going to the prom. I arrived back from my trip. Oh, while we were in St. Martin, it was the first time I've ever been like disconnected from people because the phone lines were down and our cells didn't work and I couldn't find out what was going on at home. By the time I got into the States, I had like 50 messages on my phone because people had been calling me. So I thought, oh, something's really wrong. We um, got home that night, it was, it was probably 1.30 in the morning. I'd listened to a bunch of messages. The prom was the next day, so I didn't miss it. I got to see her go, and she marched in, and it was wonderful. She stayed all night, she danced all night, she went to the after party. She had one staff who hung out at the wall. Her friend said, we'll take her, and they did. The only time the staff was needed is if she needed to go into the bathroom. Otherwise, she was with her friends the whole night, and it was wonderful. And those were friends she's had all through high school, started in kindergarten. Graduation. Here I fought all through school. Don't send the small bus, she's not getting on it. The bus stops at the end of my driveway, all the neighborhood kids get on it, she's getting on it. We made it work. I fought for everything all the way through school for her to be included. Our first IEP of her senior year, they said, well, this is a graduation year. I guess we should do something special for her so she doesn't have to go to graduation. I said, what? I said, no, you're going to practice. And they did. When they understood that I wanted her to go, they, they thought, well, she won't be able to sit there for an hour. She won't be able, it'll be loud. People will be looking at her. And I said, well, you practice. The only thing she wouldn't do is wear the cap. She marched in with her class. She sat during the whole assembly. She got up and she got her diploma. She shook the principal's hand. And she just did a wonderful job. So after graduation is work, and she actually is putting money in the bank this day. She kind of doesn't understand at that time what the concept of giving her the money that she just took out of her vending machine, what that was about. But she actually enjoys going to the bank now. She has a coin roller. She loves the coins rolling up. And she likes to bring the money to the women. And they all just um, make a big deal when she comes in. And she enjoys going to the bank. This was the first time she took any money out of her vending machine, and I kind of put it in front of her and said, show me the money, so. Um, well, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about her vending machine business. Um, we had done discovery, started in high school, and we really um, tried to find some things that Courtney would be really good at. I'll tell you, I had developmental therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. I had all these therapies in my home when she was really little, and I'm lucky I had them in my home. But Courtney always liked to take things and put them in something, and then dump it back out and start over. It was a good tool for me to cook, because I could give her some things and she'd be good. But they were telling me, professionals, stop her from doing that. She's perseverating on that. She'll, it'll stop her, it'll stunt her. She won't learn other things. It was such an activity that she loved, I couldn't stop her from it. And she just really enjoyed, she loved all my old pocketbooks, bags, boxes. She would take her toys or whatever she had and she would load it up and then she would dump it out. Well, that became a good work skill. She loves to, and she also learned how to match things really well. That was something that school drilled in her head and it really has actually come out to be another good um, thing for her, her business. Um, you can't stump her in the vending machine. If two things look very similar, but they're not the exact product, she knows the difference. 
She likes to put things in things. That's a perfect match for her. She actually has a big fascination about food. And so having to look at food and touch food and put it in the vending machine and that she's sorting something and matching are all great skills. She enjoys it. She doesn't do it for the money. I don't think it has much meaning to her. But because she has this extra money, she can live a better lifestyle. She has more money in the bank than if she didn't work. Even though she makes enough that they actually tap into her social security, she still has much more because of working. And we have worked with the CWIC and we understand how that works. And she really enjoys it. If you tell her you're gonna go to work, she gets ready and she's ready to go. Some practical ideas for a full life. We really discussed and thought about, had team meetings, planned, talked to people uh, about what we wanted. We had to have a vision. And my vision was that Courtney is going to have a life independent of mine. My husband wasn't of the same mind. He thought Courtney should always live with us. And I said, no. I want to know that when I'm gone, she has a life that's gone on beyond me. I also want the opportunity as a parent to be just a parent, not a caregiver. Um, when she lived with us, I could not even go for a walk around the block unless somebody was with her or we made some other arrangements. So I wanted to know that her life would be okay. And we, what really changed my husband's mind is we had a wake-up call. I had kidney cancer five years ago, and in that same year my husband had a major heart attack. So we may not be here forever. So we started thinking about how devastating that would be for Courtney if she only always lived with us and relied on us and we were gone. So we, all, we developed a supportive team and champions for Courtney. The people who are supporting her now are not the people we started with. And we've had to go through some people who haven't worked out, but we have a really strong team. And we thought about employment and what skills she had and what would be good for her. An important thing, a person needs to establish credit. Um, and we did that for Courtney. Uh, we got her a credit card when she was 16. And it was a co-credit card. And we also um, established a small trust fund for her. And there's not a lot of money in it, but my life insurance and other things will go into it. I have a small little bit put in each week. And it's money that she can use in the future. And we looked ahead at grants and low-income programs. Uh, we really wanted her to own her own home. One of the things I did was I got a photo ID. This is a horrible picture, but nobody likes their, their photo, right? Um, but I did kind of block out some kind of information because I don't want anyone to steal her life. So the reason this is such a bad picture is we went to have her picture taken because we wanted her to have a form of ID. And they really had us do it over and over again because she was either looking the wrong way or not smiling. And finally she got really mad and grumpy and just sat there. And they said, oh, she, now she's not even smiling. I said, we'll take it. Nobody likes her photo ID. But we needed that to also purchase her house. She needed to have a form of ID. But I think it's important for all adults to have an ID. If you don't have a driver's license, you should at least have an ID. And we used the USDA home loan program, like I talked about earlier, for her to buy her home. And that has really uh, worked out well for her. And that's Courtney's story. I do have one more thing I want to share with you. And it happened on Mother's Day this year. I was in church with Courtney. And... Oops. Courtney doesn't usually like to hug people. And I get a random hug. Everybody gets a random hug every once in a while. And lots of times it's a halo hug where she doesn't really touch you. She's just kind of around you. And we had just got done standing up and singing a song in church. And she turned sideways and wrapped her arms around me and put her head on my shoulder and held me really, really tight. And everybody sat down because the song was over. I wouldn't sit down. I just let her hug me and hug me and hug me. Probably five seconds, I don't know. And the whole church went, oh. So that's my story of Courtney. So thank you.